Dr. Ming Wang is a man that I have known for about eight or more years and is a personal friend. He and his wife have been in my life in my home. I have the utmost respect for him. I lost the sight in my left eye about eight years ago. And the, the, the care and the treatment that this man has given me and the friendship has just been uh, outstanding. So tonight, when Dr. Ming Wang comes, I want you to know, uh, you, you see on the, on the seat there, there's a, a, a biographical sketch. You can read that. An individual that has come from Harvard, MIT, and is traveling to China and is known throughout this country for his work and the expertise that he brings to this subject. And so, I mean, to the eye, plus addressing the subject we're going to deal with tonight. So we want to welcome you. Uh, I know there's a diverse group. I'd be a if I said, well, hey, this is this. There's somebody from Rocket Town, my daughter Melanie over there. And then there's Kenneth. Where's Kenneth? Kenneth's running for mayor in, in another year. And so we've got a great group here tonight. But I'm going to be quiet. We're going to take time. We'll cut about five of And then we're going to have a little concert, believe it or not. Uh, but I'll let my, my dear friend uh, share that. So would you warmly welcome tonight Dr. Ming Wang. <laughs> today. And uh, I'd like to address, uh, thank Larry Doris for the invitation. And um, I feel that this group, the THG group, represents something, represents something which is unique. It's different from the churches we go, some of us go to churches, some of us don't. And church is more confined in its topic, and it's also confined in its membership. But this is an open group, inclusive folks from churches or folks from non-religious sectors of society. And so people are more diverse, inclusive, and the topics are also more wide-ranged, including not just faith-based topics, but also including discussions such as tonight, which we will de delve into the issues of faith versus non-faith. And uh, so I think this uh, Larry and Doris is making a unique contribution to our society, to our community, by introducing THG, by being able to develop such a unique uh, form for us to share. And lastly, I think the differentiation comes from the importance of topics. For example, tonight we're going to touch upon faith versus science. The tough issue of our stem cell, fetal tissue research, and uh, these are not type of issues that uh, typical church will be willing or dare to address. So the diverseness of people, the diverseness, inclusiveness, and wide range of topics, and the importance of the topics chosen that face our society. These are three differentiating features to me for TAG. So it's an honor for me to be part of this group. And I'd like to... Um, uh, in the next 40 minutes or so, talk about just a general debate about atheism versus faith. And talk about my personal story in terms of my pathway seeking the truth about life. And uh, showing uh, one example about in medicine how we resolve the conflict between faith and science. So these are three things I want to cover. And uh, I'm the president of Tennessee Chinese Chamber of Commerce, uh, co-founder of Tennessee Immigrant and Minority Business Group, and teach at the University of Tennessee, and we have foundations for China Bible and the Psy Restoration. Atheism versus faith. Because our lives are limited, we are mortal, Ever since the beginning of the time, human beings have been asking the question, what's the purpose of our life? At the moment, our hearts are beating. Doesn't mean everything we have done amounts to nothing. It's unfathomable to think that everything we do could even turn out totally meaningless. But if we were meaning, what are the meanings? So, human beings, because of our weakness, our mortality, our limitedness, everything about us is limited, limited lifespan, 
limited physical stature, that we are seeking something we don't have, which is immortality, unlimitedness, and something that give us a sense of continuity so that we can go to sleep every night, feel that all these will not just end up amounting to nothing. And um, I was talking to my friend Anil today in the crowd there, Anil, and I will ask Anil to explain the Goodell's proof in a moment. There are various different efforts that human beings for millennia in human history trying to understand, is there a purpose? Is there a faith, belief that is valid for our human societies? Or is it all purposeless and random? And I'm going to just name a few, and some of you may be familiar with, we'll go into a little bit detail in a moment. Turing's test, Goodell's proof, Roger Penrose, the professor at Oxford, wrote this book called The Emperor's New Code. And very, very insightful. Quantum mechanics and probabilistic theory essentially saying that nothing can be absolute. Creation versus evolution. How do we address to account for the mountains of evidence that Darwin has uncovered the species change? How do you put it in the context if one believes in intelligent design? And the random collision with versus intelligent design. So these are some of the issues that human being has struggled try to understand atheism versus faith. Now I'd like to talk briefly about my personal struggle, personal journey from being an atheist. I was not born as one not born as a man of faith, and uh, truly believing science. And how I came into crisis by just believing science, and where I'm now. I really don't feel I'm stopping, I'm still continually evolving and learning, as all of us. This is a map of China, Forbidden City, and I grew up in a family that uh, Medical school professors and the teachers, my mom, brother, and my father. And I was born as an atheist. 80% people in China are atheists today. 1966, I was subjected to this what we call cultural revolution or cultural holocaust, where millions of young people were deported, cut off, their education process were cut off, and they were sent to poorest part of the country and condemned a lifetime of poverty and hard labor. Because communist government did not want to have anybody with knowledge and education to challenge them. Can you imagine a whole country as big as China, all the universities were shut down for 10 years, destroying the future of 20 million. It turns out one way to escape deportation is to have a music talent. So if you can play an instrument such as Chinese violin or boom, and you might be able to exempt from deportation because communist government need song and dancers for their propaganda troops. So you may be allowed to escape the devastating fate of deportation because once you're deported, that means you'll be playing, uh, working, laboring in the field for the rest of your life, earning one dollar a month for the rest of your life. Abject poverty at the height of your life, when you finish junior high, senior high, you'll be cut off and you can. So at age 14, I was finishing my junior high, I was going to be deported. I was a straight student, by zero chance to go to college, because all college was shut down. So I picked up this instrument to play in Chinese violin, not for love of music, but for sheer need to survive. And I remember I picked up this instrument a piece that written by this blind artist, Abi. He wrote this piece called Two Springs with Black in the Moon, depicting how beautiful it is at night, you walk out, see the two springs converging, reflecting the image of the moon. But it is a beautiful piece, one of the most beautiful pieces in Chinese repertoire, 
not because the natural beauty that it depicts, but because it was a imagined beauty. The artist, the composer, could not see. He was blind. So he was imagining how beautiful it could have been if he could see. So the piece was filled with a sense of longing, unfulfilled need, and with melancholy. So at age 14, I should be, you know, like every other teenager, looking to a life of possibilities and excitement. I was thrown at the bottom of the life, together with millions of others, due to the deportation program. So I was resonating with the sad feeling of this blind composer playing his piece, because he could not see physically I could not see mentally in the future. Then the Chinese government actually put a stop to all the music learning throughout the country because they, all of a sudden they saw this suddenly found interest in music. Uh -huh. <laughs> By tens of thousands of young students, they figured out something they were up to, not for the sake of music, so we can even continue learning music. And then pick up dancing. There's the multidome's red art. And the uh, dancing career learning was cut short as well because this was, I was 14, 15, learning dancing. Trying to get into propaganda troops so you can avoid deportation. So on dance troops. 1976, the dictator died. China realized what a tragic mistake it had made upon itself by having destroyed one generation of young people. They reopened colleges and it was crazy. There were 10 times more students trying to get into college that year. And I was a ninth grade dropout because I was not allowed to go to senior high. And uh, I was trying to get into college that year, together with millions of others. I was lucky to get into college, but then I wanted to come to America because I hated totalitarianism, government, dictatorship. I wanted freedom. And a chance meeting with an American visiting professor who lent me $50. I impressed him. We just kept on asking the same question, and no idea what he was saying, because my English was so limited, but he was impressed, not by my English or lack of, but by my persistence. So 1982, together with thousands of other Chinese students, I arrived in America with $50, borrowed from the professor, and the borrowed enough money, one-way airplane ticket, dropped the National Airport, Washington, D.C. $50 with a Chinese English dictionary, but with a big American dream. Mm -hmm. I've been very lucky to go to some of the good schools here in this country, and I firmly believe in science. I felt I'm gung ho, I was gung ho scientist, science provide the answer. But it's interesting that as I study medicine, Unexpectedly, I find evidence to the contrary. You would expect that the more you study, the more answers you have. But the more I study, the more questions I have. <laughs> For example, if you look at the human retinal architecture, that it is so complicated, so complex, it is unfathomable it could evolve from random chance. If you look at human brain, the number of neuronal connections in one person's brain, the number of synapses, is more than all the stars we have ever discovered in the entire universe. The neuronal connections in one person's brain. And being a gung-ho student of science, I was in crisis because I find mathematically there was not possible such a complex structure if I had to continue to believe what I believe in, that is science was the savior of the whole world. The neuronal connections. And DNA. We have three billion base pair DNA. GATC. I'm a human genome project. I was part of that human genome project in the late 1980s. Human being sequenced in type 3 billion base pair. You may say, well, are we deciphering, finally has deciphered the secret of life? No. That's only 10,000 miles. You have just made one step. Because 
having sequenced human genome is like walking to the library with all the books. You actually know the physical, you pick up any book, you open up, you can see the physical location of each of these letters, G, A, T, C, G, A, T, C, A, T, C, C, different sequence. But you have never learned the grammar of the DNA language. So while physical base positions are there, you do not know what they mean. It will take many, many, many years of human being to understand the biological meaning of the three billion base pair human sequence, the chromosome. <coughs> the complexity of human genetics is daunting. Give you a sense how complicated. If you compare the scale of a single gene mutation to a human being, the individual, you, who harbor those genes, and now we say when there's a gene mutation in a single gene-based pair, it will cause the whole human being to be sick. If you have breast cancer, gene mutation causing breast cancer, gene mutation causes cystic fibrosis. Because there's such a huge diff scale of difference, genes, tiny, tiny, human being, individual, to say this gene mutation will cause this human being to be sick, based on single mutation. It's like saying, if one of us sneezes, the whole earth shakes. <laughs> that is amazing. So what's the explanation? It's the complexity of the entire organization, from gene, to protein, to cells, to tissues, to organs, <coughs> to the individual. Human brain is fascinating. In fact, one of the things that Goodell's proofs that I need to ask him to mention briefly has to do with circular reasoning. Interesting question is, will we be able to, in principle, understand human brain by using human brain? <laughs> <laughs> but I knew I was playing table tennis with this afternoon, reminded me <coughs> that if you put a machine behind the screen and you ask questions, and if the machine so well constructed will give you answers eerily sounding human, and if you cannot tell behind the screen is a machine or a human, that passes the Turing test. Roger Penrose, who occupies the Isaac Newton seat at Oxford University. He wrote a book called Emperor's New Clothes. Begin this way. Year 2065, something. In American University, students came to commencement. And on the stage, there was this clock. There's something behind the clock. And the students all stood up as commencement started asking it or her or him a question. Amazing. The answer by it or her or him will be printed on the screen on the top. The student will say, um, how, um, you know, what's the weather today? It will say, weather's kind of cold, but I feel like I want to have a couple of hot coffee. <coughs> <laughs> and that's where the book starts. It's explore this age-old question that, is it possible by having fast enough computers and knowing enough neuronal chemistry to synthesize intelligence. Can we, in principle, scientific development to a stage where we know all the neuronal connections and chemical equations in our brain and body be finally synthesized this thing called intelligence? Is it possible that you have one tree is a tree, Two trees, you have three, two trees, three trees. Where is it? Is it 100th tree or 1,000th tree? This concept called forest is born. Where? Is it possible, knowing our computer computing power, that deep thought has actually beaten the world chess? 
check. So is it possible with science development that we will be able to create intelligence, or is it there is a fundamental gap? There's a need for something superhuman that to bridge that gap. We will never be able to create fast enough computers to actually create the intelligence and self-awareness. So this book, this book asked a question at the end of the book. Roger Penrose said, oh, I forgot. When he saw the book, so the student asked all these questions. And one student asked one question, and that's how the book started. At the end of the book, after exploring the question whether it is in principle possible or not to synthesize intelligence, the book ended by <coughs> telling you what this student asked. This last student, at commencement, stood up and asked it or her or him behind the screen. The student asked, how do you feel? Mm. <laughs> it's the feeling. It's the emotion. It's the self-awareness. It's the intelligence. It's a something beyond the physical composition of our cells, genes, and proteins. And of course, we know evolution versus creation. There's no denying there's tremendous amount of evidence supporting the gradual change of species adapting to environment. But at the same time, as I said earlier, if you look at the complexity of biological organisms, it is unfathomable it can arise from random collision. And finally, uh, there's also a question that using human brain, understanding human, is it a circular thinking? Is it possible for us to truly decipher ourselves? So that's what the Goodell's proof is a mathematical proof evolved from mathematics theory. And I will ask my friend, Ping Pong, he beat me somebody today at table tennis. Uh, do graduate. And Neil, tell us briefly what Goodell's proof is. Well, Goodell's proof, uh, <coughs> Goodell's proof came out in 1930. Um, a young German mathematician came up with it. And it's uh, a proof in higher mathematics that is basically um, the equivalent of what E equals MC squared is to physics, to higher mathematics. And it, it's a proof in the sense that, um, like one of the ones you would go through in geometry, that a, if A equals B and B equals C, then A equals C. And uh, he assigned a numbering system to just arithmetic and proved that you could come up with a contradiction within arithmetic. And it's sort of like uh, taking the statement, God can create a rock that is so heavy that even he can't lift it. And that's contradictory because, um, you know, if he can't lift the rock, then he's not all powerful. And, and so you, you, you can come up with uh, self-contradictory statements within arithmetic, which goes back to just like saying, you know, can you really understand the human brain by just using your brain or the mind using your mind? And um, so you, you end up with what's, what I would say is a, a limitation on, on our knowledge. And there's different ways of resolving that. Like say in the legal system, you'll have different standards of proof. For example, sometimes you'll have to prove is something um, more likely than, than not, which means it's greater than say 50%. Or you have to prove it at, by clear and convincing evidence, which would be something like say 70%. Or it could be beyond a reasonable doubt, which would be 95%, which is kind of where we get the probabilities. So that's basically the gist of it. So the essence of what Neil is saying is that is the mathematical theorem shows that it is actually, within mathematics, arithmetic, it's actually hard to prove arithmetic within the framework of arithmetic. <laughs> it's the same argument. It's hard to analyze <coughs> understanding our brain using our brain. <laughs> so, let's prove our limit. We need to know our limit. And uh, biologically, we know the universe is about 13 billion years old. How do we know that? Big Bang. 
How do we know that Big Bang? It's because everything around us, all the stars today, are going away from us. So if everything is going away from us, 360 degrees, the logical deducement is they all used to come from one point. That was the foundation of the theory of Big Bang. And the biological is amazing because when I look at the retinal cells, neuronal connections, it will take trillions and trillions and trillions of years if it will have to develop such a complicated optical system vision based on random chance. But we only know the universe has only existed 13 years. And there's a question on dark matter. And dark matter was discovered in amazing circumstance that we find that it's supposed to be based on New Newtonian physics. When a star is further away, it's supposed to move slower. When it comes close, go further, it's supposed to slow. But the Amer American scientists a few decades ago discovered that all the planets are moving around in the galaxy with the same speed. There's no difference with respect to the distance. A star is further away from us, move just as fast. It's a fundamental violation of Newtonian F equal to MA. So from that evolved this theory of dark matter. It turns out right now, if you ask a fundamental physicist, we have only known 5% <coughs> of what we know about the nature. 95% of our matter is, cons is consisted of dark matter for which we have yet to detect. So these are the human limitations. And uh, so I was a student, I was in crisis. I would say, my God, my fundamental theory, the born, I was born as atheist, maybe science is not the audience. And I met a professor, a pediatric professor who saw the opportunity. He took me out for lunch. He said, man, what is that over across the street? I said, that's a car. He said, what's the difference between car and human brain? I said, oh, human brain is a lot more complicated. He said, um, can you believe a power random piece of metal assemble itself into a car? He said, how about human brain? Mm -hmm. From there, he opened the door for me. And I realized a fundamental deficiency in my <coughs> awareness and knowledge. That is, science cannot fundamentally bridge from physical reality to intelligence. Roger Penrose's book really, to me, means now there is a gap there. What to bridge the gap? It's something that we have very little scientific proof, but yet it, its existence is just as powerful. Just like dark matter. To this day, no physicist has ever detected dark matter. CERN in Switzerland, the largest the, uh, accelerator, is still working on. So you have not detected dark matter, but we do know dark matter is there. Why? Because 95% of the universe considers dark matter. Without dark matter, star, when it's further away, should slow down. So just like we deduce the existence of dark matter, not having been able to physically observe it, I actually finally realized the existence of God. Yes. By feeling his presence, even though I couldn't touch or mathematically deduce it or calculate it. But without him being there, then all the things doesn't work. So God to me is like dark matter. It's something you can only feel the power of his existence, see the effect. Mm. Just like you put a glass here, and this glass kind of moved by itself over there. You can't see the hand moving it, but you know, by logic, there's a hand moving that glass. Um, faith is what inspired me. I, I found myself open up my in life that I was locked up in the science alone approach. But by combining faith, I find I was liberated. I found myself being able to 
reconcile many of the deficiencies, the explaining deficiencies in my life, and I realize that many things in my life, in the life of observing others, that can be explained by this duality of science and faith. <clears throat> and they act at different times and different scales. Faith is what inspires all my work, whether it's medicine or charity. And those are examples of my medical work. Uh, these are textbooks that I published in the cavern and laser surgery fields. And these are procedures we do. Laser eye surgery, young people, 3D LASIK, middle age, baby boomers. We have technology now to get rid of reading glasses, 3D for any lens surgery, and older folks, laser carrot surgery. And foundation work to help blind patients all inspired by faith. The music instrument that I played during Cultural Revolution tried to escape deportation, now became a hobby. I played with my friend Carlos, and we created a band called Music for Sun, and to, to help raise public awareness of the um, effort to help the blind. And this is my adventure with Dolly Parton, and she sang a country song that played an ancient Chinese violin, the, the instrument played in Cultural Revolution, and we actually have CDL. <laughs> and the dance that I learned during Cultural Revolution, trying to escape deportation, trying to get into the song dance troops of communist government, now became a hobby as well to help elevating the emotional appeal of the cause of civilization because few things is as powerful, as beautiful, to see beautiful ballroom dance and then realize the preciousness. Uh, China, we're involved in China Bible Project now, to have the possibility of recruit for God's kingdom called a human race. And I find myself, by, able, by opening myself to the possibility of faith, accepting, believing, and allowing God come into my life, fulfill the void between intelligence and the physical constitution. Just like allowing dark matter, the concept, to exist even though you, you, you can't feel it. But when you see this cup goes up in air, you know there's an invisible hand moved up there. So I want to challenge you all, for example, with one tough question. Faith in science. 